Thanks, Billy, for that very, very thoughtful prayer. And uh, good morning, folks. Lovely to be here. It's always a privilege to bring God's Word, and I count it as such this morning. Uh, I invite you to turn with me to 2 Kings chapter 7. 2 Kings chapter 7, it's about halfway through the Old Testament. Uh, so if you look the first part of the Bible, just about in the middle of that, the page of my Bible is page 440, 2 Kings chapter 7. Friends, I invite you to hear the word of the Lord. Elisha said, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seer of flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. The officer on whose arm the king was leading, that's the king's aide or personal assistant, said to the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? You will see it with your own eyes, answered Elisha, but you will not eat any of it. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go into the city, the famine is there and we will die. And if we stay here, we will die. So let's get, uh, go over to the camp of the Syrians, the Arameans, and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. At dusk they got up and went to the camp of the Syrians. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. For the Lord had caused the Syrians to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was, and they ran for their lives. The men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. Then they said to each other, We're not doing right. This is a day of good news and we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called to the city gatekeepers and told them, We went to the Syrian camp and not a man was there, not a sound of anyone, only tethered horses and donkeys, and the tents left just as they were. The, date, the gatekeepers shouted the news, and it was reported within the palace. The king got up in the night and said to his officers, I will tell you what the Syrians have done to us. They know that we are starving. So they have left the camp to hide in the countryside, thinking they will surely come out, and then we will take them alive and get into the city. One of the officers answered, Make some men take five of the horses that are left in the city. Their plight will be like that of all the Israelites left here. Yes, they will only be like all these Israelites who are doomed. So let us send them to find out what happened. So they selected two chariots with their horses, and the king sent them off to the Syrian army. He commanded the drivers, go and find out what has happened. They followed them as far as the Jordan, and they found the whole road strewn with the clothing and equipment the Syrians had thrown away in their headlong flight. So the messengers returned and reported to the king. Then the people went out and plundered the camp of the Syrians. So a seer of flour sold for a shekel, and two seers of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leant in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway, and he died, just as the man of God had foretold when the king came down to his house. 
It happened as the man of God had said to the king, about this time tomorrow, a seer of flour will sell for a shekel and two seers of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. Friends, this is what the Lord says. Father, open our eyes that we might see something of your glory. Open our ears that we will hear your word. And open our hearts through your spirit that we will be filled with love and joy and obedience. Amen. Just before my wife and I went to our first pastoral ministry, we met with the church and all of us were seated in a circle. And the lady sitting next to me, very sweet lady whose face was shining, she turned to me and she asked me, do you believe in fairies? I didn't know what. Do you believe in fairies? <laughs> I can't remember what my answer was. My wife said, I said, uh, it depends. <laughs> I was being very diplomatic. And then she told me that the fairies used to speak to her, and once she had spoken to the Martians, and that was my introduction to my first pastorate. So the question I want to ask you is, do you hear voices? Do you hear voices? Now, if you say you hear them all the time, then we'll call for the men in white coats and they can come and take you away, all right? But do you sometimes hear voices? In the game park, when you go on a night drive, quite often the driver will switch off the lights and in the darkness he will say, just listen. And you listen to the incredible sounds that there are. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like heights very much. When I look down, I get a bit nervous. But I always hear two voices. And the one voice says, jump. <laughs> and the other voice says, it's a long way down. <laughs> when I go to a game park and the lions are walking alongside the car, there's one voice that says to me, they're just like your cat Francis. Put your hand out and stroke the lions because they're not very dangerous. And another voice says to me, if you want to retain two arms, then make sure that you wind the window up. I think it's true that we all hear voices every day. And some of those voices are good voices because they tell us what is right. Sometimes those voices are bad voices and they tell us, what is wrong. On one occasion, Jesus took his disciples to a mountain place called Caesarea Philippi. And he said to them, who do the people say that I am? And I'm sure you remember their answer. Some said, you are John the Baptist, you are Elijah, you are Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And then Jesus said, but who do you say that I am? Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon, son of John. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And so he was saying that Peter had heard God's voice in relation to who Jesus was, the Messiah and the Son of God. My friends, what God says is more important than what people say. What God says is always more important than what people say. Because what people say isn't always accurate, is it? Sometimes people tell us what is wrong. And so to rely on that which is wrong is a very dangerous thing. Uh, if you ask for directions and uh, you don't know the way, people so often will tell you, go there, and then you go there, and someone says, go there, and go there. And so we can be misled by what people say. And the, the other trouble with people's voices is that people don't always do what they say. A man says, I don't think young people should ever drink. And he overindulges himself. And so people don't do what they say, and they are not accurate. They are not always helpful. But my friends, God's word is always true. 
God's word is always true. And it doesn't depend what language we speak. It doesn't depend what culture we represent. It doesn't depend on the color of our face. It doesn't depend on what our history or alma mater is. What God says is always true. You know what WWJD means. What would Jesus do? Now, I want to tell you, I don't think that's altogether correct. Because if I ask myself, what would Jesus do in my business situation? How would he face this complicated problem? I, I think I would have to guess what I think Jesus would do. I would prefer to have it this. What did Jesus say? What did Jesus say? W-D-J-S or W-D-J-D. What did Jesus do? Because God has told us that he is always true to his nature and his promises. My favorite verse in the Bible is 2 Timothy 2 verse 13. I don't know if you know it. If we are faithless, he remains faithful for he cannot deny himself. And God always does what he says. He's always true to his nature and to his promises. Now let's go to the story that we have read. Fairly long story in 2 Kings 7, which is our passage for this morning. We're talking about something that took place in the 9th century BC in the northern kingdom of Samaria. So not in Jerusalem, but uh, further north. And uh, there was a king of Samaria called Jehoram, who was actually a bad king. He didn't do well in the sight of the Lord. Now, the city of Samaria had been besieged by the Syrians. And the Syrians were encamped outside the entrance to the city of Samaria. And what made matters worse, not only could they not get out, but there was a famine in the land, as there's been in our country in many parts, and because of that, the people were in dire distress. They were now within the city of Samaria. They couldn't get out, and uh, goods couldn't get in. Now, the story says that there were four men who had leprosy. If you don't mind, I know uh, it's only politically correct to say men with leprosy and not lepers. But <laughs> much quicker to say lepers, isn't it? Here were these men, the lepers, who presumably had a house right on the outskirts of the city. And they said, we're in a plight. We've got no food. If we stay where we are, we're going to die. If we somehow get inside, there's no food there. So let's throw ourselves on the mercy of the Syrians. Let's go to the Syrian camp and say, won't you take us in? Won't you please feed us? If they kill us, we'll be no worse off than if we just stay. To their surprise, when they come to the Syrian camp, they find that there is nothing there. All the people have left. The camp is empty. And what they do is they help themselves to some gold, to some silver, to some clothing. They come back, they hide it. They come back, they take some food, etc. And then they have a pang of conscience and they say, no, we're doing wrong. We should share this news with others. And so they go back into the camp. They tell the gatekeeper, please, Tell the king that the Syrians have fled and they've left all their possessions and all their food inside the tents. Uh, king Jehoram is, uh, is suspicious and he says, I think this is a trap. They're just doing this to trick us. And the moment we go out from the gate, they will attack us and we will all be killed. And uh, one of his captains said, you can't lose anything. Why don't you... Why don't you send out five chariots to find out? And if they are killed, well, we've lost five chariots, but that's how it goes. Uh, the king very cautiously says, we'll send just two. And so he sends two chariots. And the horsemen on them find that the Syrians have not only gone, but they have strewn their possessions all over the road, and they have gone. And uh, what we hear is that God has caused a great miracle that um, the Syrians camped outside had heard the sound of a mighty army and had taken fright and they had all run away. And so, of course, when the news got to the people, 
the people went to the Syrian camp, helped themselves, but the king's aide, the man to whom, who was very skeptical about God, whether God could intervene, um, he had said to Elijah, this can never happen. Even if God opened the heavens and it rained, there wouldn't be enough food in one day. This can't happen. And Elisha said, I tell you, in one day, food will be plentiful, they'll sell it dirt cheap, and, uh, and you will have, you'll be able to eat anything you like, but you will not eat of it. As the people ran to uh, the city of Samaria, or from Samaria to the Assyrian tents, they trampled the king's aid, and he died. And so he wasn't able to share. Now, I want to just contrast two voices. The first is the voice of people, what people say. What did people say in the story? I suggest to you verse 2, we find in the king's aid the voice of skepticism. Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? Not even God could do this. The voice of skepticism. I think we hear the voice of skepticism very often around us. When our children went to university, they heard the voice of skepticism. I don't believe in God. I don't believe in uh, creation. I don't believe in this. I don't believe in the Bible. The voice of skepticism comes, even sometimes in the church. We dare not trust God for anything beyond what we know we have. The voice of skepticism is a very dangerous voice. Being skeptical about God and his power is dangerous. Can you remember Genesis 18, the story of Abram and Sarah? And uh, God tells Abram that Sarah's going to bear a child. And Sarah laughs. And God is angry. And God says, is anything too hard for the Lord? Verse 9, on behalf of the, uh, coming from the men who had leprosy, verse 9, we see the voice of conscience. Then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news, and we are keeping it to ourselves. And so it's very clear. They, they had a pang of conscience. They were stealing. They were taking from what had belonged to the Syrians, and then they realized that what they were doing was wrong. Their consciences said that's wrong. God has placed conscience within every single one of us. Emil Brunner, the Swiss theologian, said that actually this is what constitutes the image of God in man. That God has given us a conscience as a kind of inner robot that tells us when it shines either amber or then red, don't do it. It's wrong. See, my friends, following conscience is what God intends. In Romans 2, the Apostle Paul speaks about the Gentiles, and the Gentiles haven't had God's written law, and so they, they, they don't have it in written form as the Jews do, but they are still guilty because they have creation as a witness. And then Paul says not only do they have creation, they also have conscience. Romans 2.15 the requirements of the law are written on their hearts, their consciences also bearing witness. And so I want to say very practically, when your conscience says, don't do it, when you feel uneasy about something, just that feeling, uh, is that right? No, it's wrong. Remember God speaks through his conscience. I remember a colleague of mine being very honest, and he shared with me the story that uh, he and his wife, because they'd been very helpful to two people who were quite well off, they had been given a very expensive lounge suite. Now, they had a burglary, and the assessor was coming, and they thought if the assessor comes and sees this lovely lounge suite, then it's going to look as if we are very wealthy and so on. And so they took the lounge suite and they put it in the back garden. And that's what they did until the day before the assessor came. Um, my colleague's little boy said to him, 
Daddy, are we going to show this man the sweet in the back garden? And for him, that was the voice of conscience. And they went and they fetched the sweet and they put it back and did not hide it. Boys 12 and 14, we have the voice of reason without God. King Jehoram is initially very suspicious. It's a trap. I'm not going to go there. I know they're hiding outside. And, and when the captain says to him, send five, he says, well, I can't afford to lose five. Let's just send two. And if two chariots are lost, well, that's not too much loss. Let's try it. It sounds very sensible. It makes sense, but not if you leave God out of the picture. It only makes sense if there wasn't a God. And so I say the voice of reason without God is a difficult, it's a dangerous path. God has said if we lack wisdom, we must ask of God. James 1 verse 14, because God gives to all men liberally. And he, he, doesn't, he doesn't punish us. He, he gives his wisdom if we ask him. Our wisdom must never leave God out. Some of you who have studied history will know of the Renaissance that took place, the Enlightenment, about the end of the 13th century is when it began. Marco Polo, just after his time, when people began to explore when the modern scientific movement came into being, when uh, suddenly the eye, the, dark, the darkness of the Middle Ages uh, was broken and there was the light of the Enlightenment. There are two ways in which the Enlightenment moved. The one was towards rationalism. A rationalism that said reason is king. Only what we can reason is true. And Part of that movement was a deism that says, use your mind, but God is far away. Uh, your mind is what you need to use to make decisions. But when the Enlightenment went with God and in God's direction, it turned at the beginning of the 16th century into the Reformation. When the Reformers said, use your mind and ask for God's Spirit to enable you to understand what God has written for every person, not just for the priests, but for everyone. Use your mind. Let your mind be taught by the Holy Spirit. And that is of God. You see, reasoning outside of God's revelation will lead us to our own limited wisdom. If we don't allow God to help us and we don't ask for His wisdom every day, we will be able to progress no further than the limits of our own wisdom. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 19, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. The intelligence of the intelligent I will frustrate. When you make plans in your business or at home, ask God for the wisdom that you need. God, you have promised wisdom to me. Won't you give me your wisdom? I've got a little formula. When I've got to make crisis decisions, decisions where the Bible is not absolutely clear-cut, do I go there or do I uh, go to the other place? I have a little formula. I say, Lord, bring my head and my heart together. Work in my head, work in my heart, and bring the two together, and then I can know it's of you. Secondly, what God says. What does God say through Elisha, the prophet? God speaks first of all with the voice of authority. Look at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Do you understand that? As I was preparing this week, it just struck me again. What an incredible privilege it is to bring God's word. That I can actually say to you, friends, hear the word of the Lord, this is what the Lord says. And I can do so without any apology. I don't need to apologize for what I'm saying. I can say I am speaking with the authority of my Lord and King. This is what the Lord says. God speaks through his word. Jesus prayed in his high priestly prayer, sanctify them by the truth, 
Your word is truth. My friends, this is the word of the Lord. Hear the word of the Lord. Listen to what the Lord says. We see the voice of salvation. Now, if you look back to chapter 6, verse 24, you see that um, the city of Samaria had been besieged. Now, in verse 1, what we see is that Elijah was, Elisha was prophesying that the drought would come to an end and that those who were selling their wares would sell them in the gates and they would be dirt cheap. Now, almost every shop I go into somehow has a sale. <laughs> but what I think is that everything becomes more expensive, not, not cheaper at Christmas time. All the prices go up, but everywhere is selling a sale. But some of those sales aren't genuine. You can buy fruit on sale from fruit and veg, and sometimes the sale is simply because the fruit is about to go off. The voice of salvation, what happened is that the siege on Samaria was lifted. And overnight, the resources became plentiful. And the, uh, the traders were selling at ridiculously low prices. Everything they had. Why? Because there was so much food. Because they had been able to plunder all that the Syrians had. God saved Samaria. Now, when we look into the New Testament, God's salvation isn't just a nation. It's not, it's not a group that is saved. The Bible tells us that every person who puts his trust in Jesus, every one of us who says Jesus is Lord and lives under the Lordship of Jesus is a Christian. God saves each person who trusts Jesus as Lord. And as Graham told us last week, this is not just a believing, I believe in God. Satan believes in God. The devils believe in God. Most people believe in God. This is trusting. And in the Greek, it's trusting into God. It's trusting into the Lord. To all who received him, John 1 verse 12, to those who believed in his name, he gave authority to become the children of God. Romans 10, 8 and 9. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified and with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Thirdly and finally, we see that God speaks with the voice of judgment. We see in relation to the king's aide here, the king's aide who is so skeptical, who says, not even God could do that in a day. Even if it starts raining, we've got no food inside. We see God comes to him in the voice of judgment. Verse 17, the king's aide was punished for his disbelief. And part of Elisha's prophecy was, that this man wouldn't share in the eating of the stuff that it was so plentiful because he hadn't trusted in God. Just as God punished people in the Old Testament when they did not accept his salvation, when they didn't believe in his way, so God is the same God. Jesus said in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And so it's not religiosity. It's not coming to church and saying, Lord, Lord, that doesn't save us. If we put our trust in Jesus as our Lord, as our King, as our friend in a personal relationship, God's judgment will not come to us. John 3 verse 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever trusts in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so we find two voices. 
Of all the voices that we hear, there are only two, really. And the one is the voice of people, people's voices that sometimes are helpful, sometimes are not. Sometimes they speak the truth, sometimes they don't. But we have God's voice, which is always true, which comes to us this morning. So, my friends, I say to each one of us, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. Father, please help us to hear what you, the Lord, say. Please help us to receive your word that we will not just be those who associate with religious people, those who are on the fringe of the church with, with no real personal experience and, and taste of it, but that we will be those who eat plentifully in your gates, those who take the bread of life and absorb it, those who drink from that well that never runs dry. Father, please help us this morning to hear your word, to receive it, and to obey it for your honor and your glory. Amen.